Australian Centre for Christianity and Culture. And I'm um, delighted to welcome, uh, formally very soon after all of the introductory stuff, Dr. Amy Erickson to give today's lecture, which I believe is going to be on the John Howard Yoda sex scandal. We're going to put it in the sexiest terms possible and church discipline. Great. Maybe that's a bit clickbaity, but uh, Amy, <laughs> I'm sure we'll give a much more judicious rendition. Uh, before I do introduce Amy properly, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Now, what Amy told me on the introductory note I remember this because there is a fun fact, and that's the bit that sticks in my mind, actually. Amy, if you don't already know, hails from Texas, although you'll probably ascertain that the moment she opens her mouth, if you haven't met her. Uh, she's a lecturer in theology at St. Mark's National Theological Cent Center, just over the road, which some of you are from anyway, so you know all of that. Now, Amy, you are about to publish a book. Let's see if I can remember, there's something to do with the, the way the Sabbath can be used to help evangelicalism. As, as a lens for the biblical narrative and kind of re-enlightening, yeah. yeah. What I said. Co-authored. Co so I have co -authored. a partner in crime. Co-authored. Yeah. Now I'm probably missing out some of the introductory material, but I'm going to say the fun fact. It's almost like uh, Amy was thought there might be some doubt that she's American, so she's given me the fact that she worked in a peanut and jelly uh, rest restaurant and was the peanut butter maker, a job you'll never meet anyone in Australia who has ever had. So in case there are any doubt, can I welcome our Texan colleague, She's also Dr. worked on a dude ranch. Sorry? She's also worked on a dude ranch. A dude, a dude ranch? Yeah. I have no idea what that is, but it sounds intriguing. <laughs> Amy, thank you. Great, thanks Jonathan. Um, I'm afraid my peanut butter grinder didn't make my packing cut when I moved here, so y'all are stuck with Woolworths like I am. Um, but yeah, I'm really grateful for this invitation, and also thanks Liz for your work um, with all the details with, with getting this set up. Um, so this is part of a wider project on church discipline. I hope there might be a book at um, some point in the future. Um, so this is just kind of one facet um, that I'm taking to explore what I think is, what I'm increasingly convinced is a really important um, topic, and I'm really eager to get your feedback and insights um, at the end of this lecture. So I'll be taking notes um, of your suggestions and questions and comments of snow and so I really, really value your input. Um, before I begin, I'm going to be making a lot of reference to Matthew 18, so I'd recommend that you um, get that out so that um, you can follow along the different verses that I make reference to throughout that chapter. And let me, I've been told I should stick to time, so let me keep track of myself here. So most of those who have heard the name John Howard Yoder by now will have also likely heard of, of his extensive and theologically rationalized sexual harassment and abuse of women. Scholars have already begun the hard and important work of interrogating Yoder's own scholarship in the dark shadow cast by his behavior. And alongside analysis of other aspects of his theology, the hallmark of which, ironically, was pacifism, these interrogations have also touched on Yoder's accounts of church discipline. Given his towering influence within his own Mennonite tradition, Yoder was in many ways the architect of the very disciplinary procedures that he experienced within his own Mennonite community. Across a time period that spans decades, these attempts were in large part ineffectual at either stopping or exposing and redressing Yoder's actions. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, served as the epicenter of Yoder's interpretations of church discipline. And this paper will extend the work begun in initial scholarly analyses with a special interest in rehabilitating Matthew 18 for developing a fulsome theology of the significant ecclesial activity. And I think it goes without saying that in the face of ongoing revelations of ecclesial abuses and failures that span the globe, whose headlines I need not rehearse here, the church can't afford not to muster the full breadth and depth of its resources to develop a theologically robust and effective culture of ecclesial discipline. And because Yoder's writings on this topic were both longstanding and extensive, I'm going to focus my attention in this lecture on two readings of Matthew 18 
as provided in his 1994 text, The World Priesthood, and then his 1997 text, Body Politic, which interestingly was published um, the same year of his death. What I'd like to suggest is that Yoder's account of the church's relation to discipline is overdetermined by his emphasis on reconciling dialogue at the exclusion of other significant layers and features of discourse that sit both within the whole chapter of Matthew 18 and then also within the entire gospel itself. But before detailing this thesis, I'll begin with a brief survey of reports on Yoder's own engagement, or dis disengagement as it were, with ecclesial discipline, and as well as with a quick summary of the current theological critiques of his interpretation of Matthew 18. So first, his, his engagement, or again, disengagement with discipline. So historian Rachel Goosen's 2015 report on Yoder's abuse of women, commissioned by the Mennonite Church USA, is an invaluable documentation of Yoder's abuse and of ecclesial and academic responses to it. She records that in addition to confrontation by several individuals, a total of seven Mennonite groups, both ecclesial and academic, investigated Yoder in some fashion over a period that spanned from the 1980s to the late 1990s. Guzan concludes that, quote, no group succeeded completely in challenging Yoder's unwanted behavior toward women, unquote. Although the first four-year-long investigation did lead to his termination from Gosham Bible College, no group resulted in exclusionary censure. One acquaintance to some of these proceedings observed that, quote, the only person not spinning their wheels or convening meetings, nor draining their energy, nor playing private detective was John Howard Yoder. He seemed very content to wait out the process." Unquote. And I don't have the space here to account for each of these attempts at addressing Yoder's abuse and then their ultimate failure to do so, but there's some patterns that we can observe. And these include, one, Yoder's insistence that his accusers had to approach him directly based on a textual variant of Matthew 18, which we'll discuss um, shortly. Another pattern is, was Yoder's casting himself as the victim of accusations and the disciplinary process. Another pattern was Yoder's deflection of disciplinary processes by redirecting them into, de into debates about his grand and noble vision for sexual ethics. Another is Yoder's insistence that the abuse his victims experienced was a matter of misinterpretation and misunderstanding of his actions and intentions. And finally, another pattern was the tendency of the disciplinary committees to focus their attention on Yoder, and especially on his restoration to the community and to his very influential uh, position of teaching within the Mennonite circles. And it was only a later committee that realized how many resources were being poured into Yoder and tried to make some attempt at establishing financial resources for victims' reparations, um, but, though they only had moderate success here. As for Yoder's writings on church discipline, there are two common and related lines of criticisms that emerge especially with regard to his interpretation of Matthew 18. One of these lines of criticisms relates to that textual variant in verse 15, which some, some manuscripts read, if your sibling sins um, against you, and then some omit the against you um, variant. So just if your sibling sins, then you should go confront them. Um, so this line of, criticism, line of criticism on Yoder's interpretation notes that um, his understanding of the against you variant was both inconsistent and skewed towards his own interest. In other words, he insisted that the against you manuscripts were more authoritative, and because of that, that the disciplinary process required that his female victims had to um, approach him personally first. Another common critical observation is that Yoder's interpretation of Matthew 18 insufficiently accounts for power dynamics, such as those between himself and his female students. But for the most part, those are, those are the main lines of criticism on his uh, interpretation of Matthew 18. And what I'd like to do is to extend those critical evaluations by suggesting that Yoder's interpretation of Matthew 18 also displays insufficient attention to other important discursive features of the text. And these overlooked, or maybe um, better put, underheard discourses are, first, the reality and severity of sin in Matthew 18. Another is the repeated emphasis on the requirement that the confronted offender listen to the church body and that communal exclusion serve as, as the direct consequence for refusal to listen. And then the third feature that he overlooks is the role of prayerful dialogue with God and also the promise of presence that's attached to the disciplinary process itself. 
Altogether, what I want to suggest is that Yoder insufficiently attends to how all these layers of dialogues and ultimately Christ's promise of presence take place between heaven and earth, where the latter is where God's will is not yet fully realized. What Yoder's oversights indicate is that a healthy theology of church discipline should proceed from the sobering awareness that this important activity takes place precisely where things are not yet on earth as they are in heaven. So first let's talk about the rhetoric of sin in Matthew 18 that Yoder overlooks. So the, the Greek word for sin, hamartia, uh, first appears in verse 15 of Matthew 18, but it's important to consider how um, the introduction of sin at that verse is framed within the, the wider chapter. There are three pericopes that precede the disciplinary instructions of verses 15 through 20. The first one opens with the disciples asking Jesus who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus replies that the greatest will be as humble as and welcoming to a child. And then the next two sections continue this use of the word little one, Greek mikroi, uh, which extend from that child in, in the opening scene. Um, and these insist that anyone who causes a little one, a mikroi, to stumble, the Greek scandalan, would be better off being drowned with a millstone. That word, that Greek word for stumble, scandalene, is, is used generally in the sense of an offense, although elsewhere it's also used of Jesus himself being a stumbling block. Um, but I think here in Matthew 18 it denotes someone acting or serving as a source of transgression and of the erosion of another person's faith. The graphic language which suggests that one who operates as such a stumbling block will be better off at the bottom of the ocean with a millstone necklace underscores the seriousness of this offense. So much so that Jesus goes on to suggest that it would be, be preferable to dismember oneself than to be thrown into the eternal fire. And then the final pericope, which, which precedes the main uh, passage on discipline, verses 15 through 20, is um, the parable of the lost sheep, which is introduced as, again, one of these little ones that is envisioned as, as straying from the communal flock. Presumably, their straying is due to the offense for which personal dismemberment or death by, by a millstone were preferable, especially since the Greek term for astray here, plonao, is used four times in a later chapter in Matthew to denote being misled by another person. So that's all the setup of Matthew 18 for verses 15 through 20 on discipline. So with all these graphic words about millstones and gouged out eyes and hellfire still ringing in our ears, it's here that the Mithenian Jesus introduces his instructions on discipline. With, with very explicit directives on what to do if a community member refuses to respond to confrontation for an offense. So my point here is that chapter 18 of Matthew does not have communal restoration or reconciliation as its initial point of reference, which, um, as we'll soon see, is how Yoder would have it. But rather, it has the gravity of protecting the weakest members of a community from harm. And as much as the parable on the stray sheep ends with the restoration of the flock, it, it, it makes very clear that the, that the vulnerable individuals themselves are actually more valuable than the rest of the flock put together. So at a minimum, what these instructions um, are foregrounded with is a sensitivity to how an individual's actions threaten the spiritual health of other community members. So now let's contrast that with how Yoder discusses Matthew 18. So in one of his exegetical uh, treatments, the one in, in body politic, Yoder only references the word sin, or uses the word sin, in the following situations. The only times he talks about sin. He uses it to either quote Matthew directly, or to insist that discipline is not about sin's seriousness, or he uses the word sin to explain what to do if you're not the one sinned against, or he uses the word sin to paraphrase the, the, the Lord's Prayer. Otherwise, he doesn't discuss it at all in his interpretation of this passage. And even in, in the last two inst instances when he's talking about the Lord's Prayer, he's mostly discussing uh, forgiveness, actually, rather than sin itself. So other than these instances, Yoder avoids using language of sin and adopts instead language of conflict, conflict resolution, offense, moral discernment, and differences. Along with that, there are two themes that tend to characterize Yoder's minimizing of the weightiness of sin in relation to the process of discipline. The first is that he defines sin primarily in terms of forgiveness. And second, he's adamant that the process of discipline is only aimed at restoration of the offender to the community. 
So first, while Yoder acknowledges that Jesus' use of the word sin, quote, assumes that the moral standards by which sin is to be identified are knowable and known, and that the offender and those who reprove him share a common moral yardstick, unquote, Yoder frames his definition of sin under the heading of forgiveness. So in other words, what sin is, is primarily something to be forgiven, as opposed to, say, neglect of God's will or um, a threat to the health of the community. A painfully obvious example of Yoder's exegetical bias and blindness is evident on the opening page of his chapter on binding and loosing in body politics. That's the 1997 text that was published the year of his death. Yoder claims that Matthew 18, 18 is underscored by a parallel verse in John 20, 23, that if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Which, according to Yoder, quote, makes it clear that one objective or one outcome of the procedure of discipline is forgiveness. Preventing an offense, reconciliation, winning the brother or sister, restoring to the community a person who had offended. Unquote. But Yoda puzzlingly neglects to mention the second half of that Johann universe, which reads, if you do not retain them, in other words, if you don't retain someone's sin, they are not retained. But Yoda completely overlooks this second half of the verse. Instead, his mentions of sin are, are always set in the sight of the authority and actually the duty of And Yoder doesn't just minimize Matthew's careful textual framing of sin by defining it exclusively in terms of forgiveness. He also does so by insisting that in its process of discipline, the community's primary obligation is to restore the offender to fellowship. Yoder claims that church discipline should focus solely on, quote, the offender's need for reconciliation and not to the resentment of the person hurt in order to give vent to his or her feelings, unquote. This dismissive language, which reduces the potential victim situation to one of presumably overstated resentment and a need to vent mere feelings, pales against, as we've seen, the language um, of Matthew 18 at the start, which takes seriously the threat which individual behavior can pose to developing faiths. And what's more, Yoder even states outright at the end of World Priesthood, that's the 90, 1994 text, that it's a misunderstanding to, quote, leave room for the idea that the sin is made right not wholly by forgiveness, but also partly by reparation of penance. So in Yoder's calculus, it's the sole burden of the offendee and the community to shoulder the work of reconciliation with no uh, responsibility on the part of the offender. And again, this sanitizing moral language flies in the face of the startlingly violent imagery of Matthew 18. Yoder's account of discipline is overdetermined by the authority and duty of forgiveness and reconciliation at the neglect of the seriousness of the threat which sin poses to the community. And it should be noted, Matthew 18 does finish with um, a striking parable on unrelenting forgiveness, but it's significant that that parable comes again on the heels of the graphic and weighty language at the start of Matthew 18. Um, and to say nothing that the, that the people viewing the parable are expressing um, evidence of remorse. We might wonder if in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's terms, Yoder has opted for cheap grace in his deafness to significant theological and discursive elements of the text. So again, that's the first element that he overlooks. So that's the biggest one that I'm gonna draw attention to. Um, alongside that language of sin, the second discursive element uh, that Yoder turns a deaf ear to is the explicit instructions on the grounds for excluding a church sibling, which is a refusal to listen. So again, both tellingly and surprisingly, Yoder says almost nothing about this potential obstinate refusal to listen, and also to the pres prescribed consequence for not listening. Um, there's one text that Yoder makes an oblique reference to listening, but he might actually be referring to listening to the offender, not to the offendee in that text. <laughs> Um, otherwise, he breezily alludes to the possibility of the approach to refusing to listen by recasting it as the refusal to be one. Uh, but the, overall, the ink that he spills to discuss forgiveness, restoration, moral discernment, conflict management is disproportional to this really significant textual aspect of the text. So the text twice uses the word listen from the Greek akouo, first in, the, in reference to the possibility of the accused listening, and then second in the negated form to discuss their first refusal, or sorry, second refusal to listen. Um, and then after that, it uses the word parakuo twice um, to indicate the second and third possible refusals. Um, and that, that word parakuo denotes um, kind of a, a hearing, an overhearing that then dismisses what's heard. 
And similarly, Yoder spends almost no exegetical energy on describing the consequence for this refusal to listen, which is exclusion from the community. It doesn't mention it, at least again in these two primary texts at all. As we've already seen, in a bewildering deafness to the text, Yoder situates discipline as primarily purposed for restoration of the offender, with no attention to the explicit instructions to exclude one who refuses to hear out the community's concerns. And this odd tunnel vision about the purpose of communal discipline is heightened by Yoda's lopsided interpretation of the binding and loosing um, verse in verse 18, which this verse he also takes as his hermeneutical key. So Yoda insists that the binding and loosing referred to in, in verse 18 has two primary meanings. One is moral discernment, and then the other one is forgiveness. So in other words, the binding and loosing can refer to um, the binding and loosing of the community's moral standards, or to the binding and loosing of, of forgiving. And he suggests that both of these are actually two sides of the same, same coin, whether you um, alter the, or apply moral discernment and then also forgiving are, are just uh, reversible sides of each other. But what's interesting is when binding and loosing refers to moral discernment, the order draws much attention to the fact that the community's moral standards might be revised or altered as a result of its discussions. And when it comes to forgiveness, Yoder only, as we've already seen, discusses the community's obligation to forgive. So in other words, that sin, that sin should only be loosed. So the interpretive problem is that Yoder only ever envisions the community as loosing, whether it's moral discernment or forgiving, never as binding, despite the text indication that both activities are equally within the church's remit. The third and final discursive element that Yoder neglects is the role of prayerful dialogue and the promise of presence that's offered in verses 18 and 19. His inattention to this significant aspect of the disciplinary process in Matthew is eclipsed by his high praise for the sacramental nature, sacramental nature of discipline. But it's key here to note in what way Yoder understands and then also fails to consider discipline as potentially sacramental. So he writes, and this is a lengthy quote, in this key passage of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus instructed his disciples that when they would carry out this particular practice, following these simple instructions, their activity would at the same time be the activity of God. What you bind on earth is bound in heaven, he said in Matthew 18, 18. Jesus thereby mandated a specific human activity, describing in some detail how it should proceed. God would at the same time be acting in, with, and under that human activity. When human and divine activity coincide in this way, that is what some denominations call a sacrament. I'm not saying the quote. In his haste to stress discipline, which remember for him is always reconciling, always forgiving, as a straightforward and even automatic divine baptizing of human action, Yoda overlooks textual clues that offer a more complex portrait of the sacramental nature of discipline. So after the, that binding and loosing phrase in, in verse 18, which Yoder references in his account of the sacramental nature of discipline, the passage then describes a small gathering of two or three church members who are praying about some matter. And the Greek word here is um, the word pragmatos. In context, that word refers to the disciplinary proceedings which have um, just been detailed. And it's interesting that that same Greek word pragmatos is used in um, 1 Corinthians when Paul um, tells the Corinthian church to handle their disputes in-house rather than resorting to secular courts. So again, pragmatos is the same word that, that Paul uses. But more immediately here, here in Matthew, there's also a verbal echo of the two and three between verses 16 and verses 20 that knit the sections together to indicate that the prayer meeting is part of the disciplinary process. Oftentimes those, these passages are, are separated or decoupled. That said, there's still a number of, of aporias here. First, what exactly is the matter on which the gatherer is said to be agreeing? They're said to be agreeing on something. Presumably based on the opening again of verse 19, which connects back to the power of the keys in verse 18, they're reaching an agreement on what's to be bound or loose by the community's discernment. But even so, in what way is the gathered throng after agreeing dependent on God to execute the matter on which they agree, which is what verse 19 indicates? If their binding and loosing is merely a matter of adjusting the community's moral standards, or determining to forgive an offendee, as Yoda would have it, then in what way is there still need for a divine activity to execute this wish? Especially if, according to Yoda, the community's action as a sacrament, sacrament is automatically a divine action here. 
And what's more, why would the promise of Christ's presence in verse 20 be of a special comfort to this prayerful deliberation? There's another interesting interpretive conundrum that this passage turns up. Jonathan, Jonathan Pennington in Heaven and Earth and the Gospel of Matthew convincingly argues that Matthew uses deliberate language about the kingdom of heaven. In short, Matthew almost always uses the singular form of the word heaven to refer to the visible earthly sky, and oftentimes that singular form shows up in the word pair of heaven and earth to, to denote the whole physical cosmos. But Matthew employs the plural form of the word heaven to indicate the divine and visible realm of God's kingdom. So this grammatical contrast ends up serving a theological point, which is to highlight the tension between the human earthly reality and God's realm, um, even while, while it's looking forward to their resolution. What's odd about our passage is that an almost parallel authorization of the power to bind and loose on heaven and earth is given to Peter several chapters earlier, in chapter 16. But in that chapter, heaven, in the phrase heaven and earth, is plural, which is uncharacteristic for Matthew when heaven is paired with earth. But in Matthew 18, 18, heaven is singular, which is in the kind of more expected pattern. But in the immediately following verse in Matthew 18, where Jesus describes the gathered few as praying to his Father in heaven, heaven is plural. Some interpreters say that the difference between plural heaven in chapter 16 and the heaven, singular heaven in chapter 18, um, even though both are using the same binding and loosing on heaven and earth phrase, has to do with the distinction between teaching and disciplinary authority within the church. Pennington himself thinks that it has to do with the way the appearance of the phrase kingdom and heaven uh, of heaven in chapter 16 triggers a kind of parallel uh, plural usage in that chapter that doesn't end up happening in chapter 18. In short, I'm not quite convinced by these explanations, but what I think might be telling is that similar grammatical differences and phrases are found in Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6. In that chapter, as in chapter 18, we have reference to a father in heaven, in which heaven is plural, and we also have a desire for human activity to enact something on earth as it is in heaven, in which the heaven is singular. What I wonder is if the grammatical similarities in Matthew 18 and its own description of, prayerful, of this prayerful moment in the disciplinary proceedings is to reinforce the way in which the church's disciplinary process is to be saturated by that prayerful desire to align with God's will. And even though that doesn't resolve all the textual and interpretive questions that I raised earlier, what it does suggest is that Yoder's reading does not offer a sufficiently nuanced account of the relation between human and divine action. In so doing, he smooths over interpretive difficulties that perhaps should be left in ambiguity and some unresolved tension. And in particular, in his haste to define the sacrament as a mere and rather mechanical substitution of human action for divine action, Yoder neglects the power of Christ's promise of presence precisely in the midst of what seems to be a communal and collective inability to act which even while reaching some kind of agreement on their situation is nevertheless reliant in some way through prayer for divine action to ensue. My hunch is that a healthy theology of church discipline will appreciate the sacramental nature of discipline as related to the dialogical gap that yields space for Christ's promise of presence to take root precisely where human and divine reality seem to sit in unresolved tension rather than to a mere coinciding of divine and human action again, as Yoder would have it. Interestingly, one critical, critical assessment of Yoder's work closes with an account from one of Yoder's victims about a moment within one of the last disciplinary proceedings when a group of Yoder's victims were invited to speak with his discipline, disciplinary committee. And she shares as follows, and this is a lengthy quote. She says, we, the group of Yoder's victims, came from all over the United States and spent two days together in Elkhart, Indiana, where we share our stories consoled and supported each other, wrote a composite story of our personal experiences of violation from John, and outlined eight steps we wanted the church to take. We took turns reading paragraphs of the story of our violation by John to the committee. Many of us experienced similar things with John, and the story felt like each of ours. When we had finished reading this, I went around the circle and addressed each of the Mennonite officials present. Do you believe us? If there was any doubt about our veracity, I wanted them to express it then and there. They responded in seriousness and respect, some with tears. I believe they were shocked at the extent of John's abuse and the pain it had caused us. 
Their only questions were to clarify what we were asking them to do, now do. They said they needed time to process this together and asked if they could serve us dinner later that evening. Together they made, made homemade soup and bread and prepared a beautiful fruit plate. They served us and it felt like a holy time of communion together. I'm not confident that Yoda's account of discipline as a sacrament can account for the sacramental nature of this moment as it resonates with Matthew 18. There's not yet an agreement on what to do in response to his abuses, but there is an agreement, a solidarity about the reality and gravity of what has happened. And while it isn't reported that there was a moment of prayer in this instance, there is an indication of the lack of resolution and a need for ongoing divine action that's suggested in Matthew 18. And there's also an indication of the presence, which is so, so often theologically connected to another sacrament, that of the Eucharist. Yoda's account of discipline as a sacrament, with its mechanical overlaying of divine and human action, cannot see how an interpersonal chasm highlighted by the disciplinary process, process is yet filled by God's presence when God's people achieve a kind of consensus, even with an, without an obvious denouement or resolution. And what's more, in contra to Yoda's insistence that discipline only never center on the perpetrator, Yoda and his reconciliation are not in sight. There's only God's wounded people gathering in solidarity in God's presence while seeking to be heard by one another. So, to draw us up to a, a conclusion. To conclude, I've suggested that Yoder's account of discipline neglects three kinds of discourses that thread throughout Matthew 18 and beyond. There's a discourse around sin and its seriousness, a discourse about listening and the consequences of its neglect, and a discourse about the promise of presence attached to prayerful communion and deliberation. I want to suggest that what ties these together is the very Nathanian theme which Jonathan Pennington draws our attention to in Matthew's discourse about heaven and earth. Altogether, Yoder's account of discipline displays an insufficient recognition of how the church exists in the gap between these visible and invisible realities. A gap where sin prevails, where the confronted may dismiss the ones confronting them with an obstinate root deafness that demands their own dismissal, and where God's church even in trying to bridge this gap, yet remains in its middle, prayerfully waiting and asking for resolution while relying on the promise of God's presence to meet them just there. So in other words, the over-realized eschatology that permeates Yoder's work is at odds with Matthew's vision of the not-yetness of God's kingdom, even as the church labors and waits for things to be on earth as it is in heaven. Yet this is clouded by Yoder's differing moral vision, which is blind to the not-yetness not of God's kingdom, and which correspondingly overreaches in its clamors for moral laxity and cheap grace. But the reconciliation of heaven and earth is not cheaply won, and all the more so while those like Yoder continue both to inflict harm and refuse to listen. And because it is not yet on earth as it is in heaven, it is with just such refusals that the church needs to continue to reckon, with a close ear to its scriptures and an eye on its living and present Thanks, Aaron.